Hi, I'm Stephen Winston, your presenter of this overview of geology, seabeds and habitats of the South Coast. I have been a diver for a number of years and the early years diving for me, and I suspect most of you, was to observe the underwater world of wrecks, reefs and anomalies dumped in quarries. For the last few years I've been diving with a purpose to understand rather than just observe this undersea world. Hence, while the excellent BZAC diver training has always been focused on how you can do it, it is not necessarily taught well what you can do with the training. So a few years ago I wanted to rejuvenate my diving and so I decided to learn more about the underwater environment and the critters that lived there. The challenge was simply learning by rote is that there is lots of critters and the problem space is too large to consume and the method of learning too boring. I needed to break down the problem space into manageable chunks. Therefore, by understanding a bit about the geology, the seabeds and the habitats they create allows me to focus on the types of plant, chromista and animal life that live in the environment I regularly visit. Therefore, this lecture is the first in the series of two lectures I am presenting that will express my learning in the areas of geology, seabed and habitats and hopefully give you a slightly different appreciation of the underwater world. My second lecture that examines the critters themselves, I use a slightly different approach to learning. So from the subset of habitats, I dive regularly. I wanted to categorize the critters. So when I look at the seabed, I can utilize a decision tree to identify what I am likely seeing. It should be noted, however, that I'm purely a recreational diver with an interest in marine life and not an expert marine geologist or biologist. So let's continue with the lecture. So what is the objectives of this presentation? We're going to look at a very basic understanding of the English Channel, coastal features, with a more detailed reference to my own regularly dived area of the Dorset coast. So therefore we're going to look at the creation of the English Channel, what we refer to as the Foss Dangard Plunge Pools, a geographical history of Britain, we're going to touch on bathymetric surveys and erosions due to tide. And then we're going to have a look at some of the vertical and horizontal sedimentary mappings. And I'll focus a little bit more on the Dorset area in that particular segment. I'll then describe some of the um, basic um, uh, theories of localised features of erosion, sedimentary classification, I will then go into what we refer to as literal zone classification. And then finally, I'll finish off looking at the habitat mappings around the south coast. We start our understanding of marine geology many years ago in the Paleolithic period, 16,000 years before the present at the end of the last ice age. Here we have a map of what the UK would have looked like we see that in the north of the UK are the snow-capped mountains and the glaciers. Further north and slightly to the right, a large inlet, which is the deep waters along the Norwegian and Swedish coastlines, also covered in ice. Looking further down to the bottom centre, you can just make out the River Thames joining the Rhine, uh, which leads into the Channel River. Many of the creatures that were present then are with us today, and those marine creatures are extremely diverse. And we're also still discovering new creatures. In the inset to the left, we have a frill shot which looks like something from the era of the dinosaurs, but is a present day deep water shark. The hagfish, which is a slime producing eel, is the only fish with a skull, but no vertebrae or jaw. And at the bottom is an impression of a megalodon, 
next to the smaller great white shark. The megalodon became extinct around 5.4 to 2.4 million years ago. In and around 16,000 years ago, the UK was still well connected to continental Europe. Ice was receding to what is now the west coast of Scotland. And there is more rivers with many emanating from the Dogger Hills. 13,000 years ago, we can see that the sea levels were substantially rising with the melting ice caps of the Holocene period, the last ice age. We can see that the high grounds of the Shetlands being separated from the mainland and the North Sea encroaching from the north. The Irish elk became extinct around this time as there was a reduction in forest sizes and possibly being hunted into suboptimal foraging grounds. The woolly mammoth was also dying off in Europe with the last to go in Siberia only 4,000 years ago. I placed a picture of the horseshoe crab in the inset but its habitat is more tropical. The horseshoe crab, which appears prehistoric, is still with us today. This anthropod is not a true crab, but more related to the arachnids, the spiders, scorpions, sulifages and ticks. The horseshoe arachnid population has declined in present day as a consequence of coastal habitat destruction and over harvesting for its blue copper rich blood. Fossil records of horseshoe crabs extend back as far as 450 million years. As the land receded further by the raising waters, the connection between the UK and continental Europe is diminishing. In the inset, I have placed a sturgeon of which there are 20 species in existence today. Some species of sturgeon are extinct. Several are on the verge of extinction, including the Chinese sturgeon, the highly prized beluga sturgeon and the Alabama sturgeon. The present day sturgeon dates back 50 million years and still keeps the primitive characteristics such as the asymmetrical heterocircle tail fin and ganoid scales. From this period of 10,000 years before present, the North Sea migrates further down, encroaching on the land until one day the North Sea meets the English Channel. One can only imagine the catastrophic event when the landmass between UK and continental Europe was finally breached. A ridge made of chalk comprised the northern limb of the Wheel d'Artois anticline which is said to have formed a narrow isthmus separating the marine habitats of the North, North Sea, and the Southwest, English Channel. In research between Dover and Calais is a place called the Foss Danigird plunge pools where water at a rate of a million cubic meters per second would have been released in the first flood. The flow the flow eroded the retaining ridge, causing the rock dam to fail and release lake waters into the Atlantic. Nowadays, the Foss Danigird plunge pools are largely infilled by various layers of sediment. So moving forward to 5,000 years before present, the North Sea had connected to the English Channel, but a few islands remain in the North Sea, including the Dogger Hills. In this period is effectively the end of the Stone Age and the start of continental influence centered from Greece, the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age was brought to Britain by the Bell Beaker people who readily mixed with any new cultures they encountered, including the Neolithic farmers they found in Britain. The bell beakers have been found in megalithic tombs within the henge temples of the Neolithics. They improved the existing temple at Stonehenge, which is proof they got on well with the original 
inhabitants. Pottery, farming, animal husbandry, woven tunics, woolen skirts, all started to make an appearance during this time. Finally to present day, Dogger Hills became Dogger Bank and the coastline appears to be very familiar. I have overlaid a picture indicating the period of geographical history. Originally the UK landmass migrated from about 20 degrees south of the equator to presently about 50 to 60 degrees north of the equator. Over the millennia we've had bedrock, much of it is exposed in Scotland, which is made up of metamorphosized sedimentary rock, effectively granite, had effects of volcano creating igneous rock, for example in Snowdonia, the Lake Districts, with Edinburgh in fact on the remains of a volcano core. As we move further southwards towards the English Channel, the rock becomes younger and younger over the geological history, with a significant amount of young sedimentary layers in the southeast. From the inset, because of this separation from continental Europe, new species have formed in the last 15,000 years, especially in the ribbon lakes caused by glaciers melting. If you examine the freshwater char around the UK, you'll find many unique to the United Kingdom, including the Malloc char, the Loch Rannoch char, the Loch Killing char, the Torgoch or Welsh char, the Shetland char, the Orkney char, the Golden char, the Largemouth char, the Horswater char and the Windermere char. And in the inset there to the right, I have placed at the top the Shetland char, uh, followed by two Windermere char. In the bottom inset, I have placed a picture of the oak. The oak was thought of as the penguin of the north, and there has been three large populations of oak off Scotland. The last oak in the UK was killed in St Kilda in 1840, later to disappear entirely from planet Earth in 1854 off Grand Banks in Newfoundland. When we examine the historical geographical map of Weymouth and Christchurch bays in the English Channel, we can see it is mainly formed through the Jurassic period, which is 201 to 145 million years ago, indicated in grey. And the younger, upper and lower Cretaceous period, which is 145 to 66 million years ago, indicated in green. At the start of the Jurassic period, sea levels rose and the desert of the Triassic period was transformed into tropical seas. Sedimentary carpets of this period formed the grey clays, yellow sandstones and golden limestones that formed the cliffs in West Dorset. These rocks were laid down in shallow seas during the lower and middle Jurassic periods. The coast around Weymouth and Portland exposes rocks that form towards the end of the Jurassic period. One of the very last rocks to form in the Jurassic period was the famous Portland limestone. The Cretaceous period started with low sea levels, coastal forests and swamps, and ended with the Great Chalk Sea when sea levels were 200 metres higher than they were today. Along Purbeck coastline, the rock of the Cretaceous period are revealed. These are limestones from swamps and lagoons, sands and grits from rivers and shallow seas, and of course, the iconic white chalk. We can now look at some present day bathymetric studies of the English Channel. Bathymetric surveys allows us to measure the depth of water as well as map the underwater features. Multiple methods can be used for bathymetric surveys including multi-beam and single beam sonar, acoustic Doppler current profilers to measure the current at different depths, sub-bottom profilers and autonomous underwater vehicles. Using other methods like bottom grabs, photography, drag video 
are also used to determine the different bottom types. The flood over the Wheel d'Artois and Decline left streamlined islands, longitudinal erosion grooves and other features characteristic of a catastrophic mega flood event which can be still be seen on the sea floor revealed by bathymetric surveys. From this map we can still see some of the old geographical features from the pinch point of the Dover Straits to a deep channel scoured by the Channel River which drained the combined waters of the Rhine and Thames at westward to the Atlantic. The Channel River is most prominent north of the Channel Island in an area we now call Herd Deep. The tides in the English Channel are generally strong, especially in the Straits of Dover. Tides may be visualised as an oscillation, a toing and froing of water caused by the gravitational attraction and the centrifugal repulsion of the Moon. This slide shows the tidal range along the English Channel with the smallest being 2 metres around Dorset and the greatest of 12 metres being present in the Gulf of San Malo. Surface temperature ranges from 7 degrees in February to 16 degrees in September. There is little temperature change with depth in the well mixed eastern waters of the Channel but bottom water temperatures fall to 5 degrees in the west. There is an overall flow of water through the English Channel to the North Sea with a complete replacement taking around 500 days. The tidal water movement and the superposition of the effects of wind causing swells and waves causes erosion along all of our coastline. No bathymetric survey is complete without the position of a few well-known wrecks. On this slide is the location of wrecks on the west side of the Isle of Wight. As mentioned in the previous slide, these bathymetric surveys can be used to determine depth, but also bottom types, which is an important indicator, for example, to dive visibility. When using bathymetric applications such as Navionics, the effects of wrecks on the seabed and hence the benthic species can be considerable. To note, benthic species are bottom dwelling as opposed to pelagic species which live in the water column. These seabed anomalies prove interesting to marine biologists as they form artificial reefs and influence habitats well from the perimeter of the wreck. As we've just mentioned, the overall water flow through the English Channel is from west to east. On the image, we can see the effects of the seabed of the twins, uh, which are the wrecks of the Innsbruck and the Val de Bordeaux off Eastbourne, with the prevailing current causing ripples in the mud in the dominant tidal direction. Coming back to Dorset and the vertical strata around Kimmeridge, we talked earlier about the creation of the English Channel since the Upper Paleolithic to Neolithic period in our history and the process of sedimentation being predominant in the southeast of the UK. So what is sedimentation? In geology, sedimentation is the deposition of sediments which result in the formation of sedimentary rock. However, the term is broadly applied to an entire process that results in the formation of sedimentary rock from initial erosion through sediment transport and settling to lithification or compaction of the sediment. The sedimentary process around a coastal bay is called sedimentary cell theory. In many formations of strata there are repeating patterns, for example clay layers alternate with sandstone layers or carbonate layers alternate with shales. 
This is usually caused by a repeated cycles of climate. In warmer times, the seas rise and carbonate rocks are deposited in shallow subtropical seas. Later, ice builds up at the poles and the sea level drops. Then the same area is close to shore and gets sand and mud washed down by rivers. Chalk, for instance, was laid down in the Upper Cretaceous period and consists mainly of the remains of microscopic algae called coccoliths. So we can examine the vertical strata around Dorset and we see many layers of clay, mudstone, sandstone and chalk layers. If anybody has dived Kimmeridge Bay, for example, you'll have seen the Nodding Donkey oil well on the west side near the cliffs. This well has produced 12,000 gallons per day in the 1960s and today still produces 2,000 gallons per day. The oil is produced underground by the compression of sedimentary layers above, from above and heat from the Earth's core on those sedimentary layers that contain plants and animal particles such as clay. This compression and heat on the carbon, oxygen and hydrogen of say wood creates the components of liquid hydrocarbons. The cracks in the strata caused creeping of liquid crude oil and gas into reservoirs located in porous sandstone. In Kimmeridge Bay, the sandstone is located about 350 metres below the surface and is tapped to release high quality crude oil. In addition, if anybody has dived the eelgrass seabeds off Old Harry Rocks, you may have seen gas bubbles leaving the seabed. This is from a small gas field located in Pool Bay seeping methane. As divers who swim the seabed, we may be more interested in the horizontal strata as opposed to the vertical one. Sedimentary processes are generally affected by gravity and hence the sedimentary layers are flat. However, with the movement of tectonic plates, the processes can lift sedimentary layers from horizontal and can buckle the sedimentary layers called orogeny or create deep cracks called faults. This means that there is not one type of sedimentary layer exposed on the seabed. One of the interesting dives in Dorset is of Kimmeridge ledges. Many marine animals have drilled themselves into the firm grey layer. This is called Kimmeridge clay. Around Weymouth Bay area, Kimmeridge clay is predominant and hence the fine silts can cause low visibility during stormy periods. The further away from the clay layer, for example towards Devon and Cornwall where the seabed is sand and gravel, we obtain better visibility. Indeed, much of the upper reaches of the channel in the sports diver range have a high component of mud. Interestingly on this picture, we can make out the Isle of Portland and we can see where the famous sandstone layer is exclusively quarried. This Portland stone has been used to build many famous buildings like St Paul's Cathedral, Buckingham Palace and the United Nations headquarters in New York. So note, in this slide we've talked about some seabed types already. gravel sand, silt, clay, mud. We'll discover the difference in a few more slides time. Let's explore some key localised geographical features that work together to produce the sedimentary cell theory. That is the erosion, transportation, deposition and lithification 
of particulate matter. In the first instant, let's explore erosion by describing what are stacks. Old Harry Rocks are located on the headland between Swanage and Studland Bay in Dorset. The headland is made out of chalk, a hard rock. The headland juts out into the sea, so it is more vulnerable to high energy waves in what we call the intertidal zone. That's the zone between the high and the low water springs. This causes the formation of Old Harry, a stack. How are stacks formed? Number one. Stacks are created by cracks being formed in the headland through erosional processes of hydraulic action and abrasion caused by the sea. Two. The cave becomes larger and eventually breaks through the headland to form an arch. 3. The base of the arch continues to become wider through further erosion until the roof becomes too heavy and collapses into the sea. This leaves a stack, an isolated column of rock. The stack is further undercut at the base until it collapses to form a stump. Over time, Old Harry will collapse to form a stump. Erosion, a concordant coastline. The area around Swanage is made out of bands of hard and soft rock. Soft rock is made of clay and sand and hard rock is chalk and limestone. These bands of rock erode at different rates. A concordant coastline has the same type of rock along its length. The alternative bands of hard and soft rock run parallel to the coast. In the central picture, we can see that a hard rock coastline is running parallel to the sea. Lulworth Cove is situated between Kimmeridge Bay and Weymouth Bay on a concordant coastline. The entrance of the cove to the left hand side of the slide is narrow where the waves have cut through the weakness in the resistant limestone. Then the cove widens where the softer clay have been more easily eroded. At the back of the cove is a band of more resistant chalk, so erosion is slower here. On the right, the folded limestone strata, known as Lulworth Crumple, is particularly visible at Stir Hole, directly next to Lulworth Cove. The rock structure was created during the Alpine orogeny, i.e. the same process that created the Alps, and exposed and has been exposed by subsequent erosion. Sedimentary transportation bars. Sometimes a spit can grow across a bay to join two headlands together, through a process called longshore drift. Longshore drift is the transportation of beach material. This landform is known as a bar. Bars can trap shallow lakes behind the bar. These are known as lagoons. Lagoons do not last forever and may be filled up with sediment. A bar feature can also be considered as a barrier bar that can connect the mainland to an island like Chesil Beach. Rather than a true tombolo, normally tombolos are created to, due to the effects of islands on waves through refraction and to the sedimentary transport which usually produces a beach perpendicular to the mainland 
rather than parallel to it. Hence, at Chesil Beach, the mainland has attached to the Isle of Portland, not the other way around. Behind Chesil Bar, you'll find a lagoon called the Fleet. Sedimentary deposition and spits. At Keyhaven on the Solent, pictured, the river called Avonwater enters the Solent behind Hurst Castle Spit, where there is a process of deposition. A spit is an extended stretch of sand or shingle caused by longshore drift jutting out into the sea from the land. Spits occur where there is a change in shape of the landscape, like a headland, or there is a river mouth. This spit provides a sheltered place for sediment deposition or accumulation. This allows mud to settle and plant-like eelgrass to grow. Eelgrass hold together mud and makes sediments resistant to the effects of strong winds and further coastal erosion. The pioneer colonising plant eelgrass helps to stabilise the area further by trapping more sediment. Gradually, heliophytes or salt tolerant plants such as glasswort and sea blight colonise the accumulating mudflats. These plants trap more sediment and contribute organic matter when they die. These processes help salt marshes to grow. Eventually the salt marshes will grow and even more complex sets of plants will colonise the area until communities such as alder and ash trees grow to develop a creek system. This is known as vegetation succession. Lithification of shale rock. We have already talked about oil production in and around Kimridge Bay. In the cliffs nearby, you'll be able to observe shale. Shale is a fine grained sedimentary rock formed as a result of the lithification or compacting of clay, silt, mud, and organic matter over time and is usually considered equivalent to mudstone. In recent years, the topic of fracking has become a sensitive subject in the extraction of shale gas to power industry and homes in the UK. If you are diving Kimbridge Bay, do take a look at the natural fracking that has gone on in the exposed shale rock. Indeed, if you get time, remove some of the hardened clay and use a naked flame lighter to burn some of the clay to demonstrate the presence of hydrocarbons. We have talked about many processes that created the English Channel we know of today, from the melting of the ice in the last ice age to the creation of the Fosdan geared plunge pools, the laying down of sedimentary layers by grading through the effects of tide, the lifting of sedimentary layers due to plate tectonics and orogeny, and through the coastal sedimentary cell theory of erosion, transportation and deposition of landmass by storm and wave energy to create rocky outcrops, stacks, caves, coves, spits and bars. We need to create a new language that will allow us to describe and communicate what we see in a scientific fashion. This is called classification, and mariners, geologists, and marine biologists use classification to describe what the seabed is like. As divers, we are probably all familiar with navigation charts, and we may have taken a precursory look at the types of seabed that are on a chart. We can see an example of a chart on the slide and can use Admiralty Chart 5011 to decipher what the abbreviations mean. So looking clockwise around the chart, we see behind the spit, as expected, is the letter M for mud. Where water rushes through Hurst Castle 
narrows, the particle size is high. And we see the symbol S for sand. And further away, where there are mollusk beds, we can see the abbreviation SH for shell. Shell will evolve into rock limestone. However, mariners are interested in this information as it could be picked up as a seabed sample on the tallow at the bottom of a lead and string sounder. In fact, for classification purposes, shells are really classified as an animal remain rather than a mineral. Admiralty uses a classification method called the Wentworth grain size classification, which ranges from boulders of 26 centimetres across to clay, which has a particle size of less than 1 in 256 of a millimetre. What is important to note is that boulders, cobble and pebble are classified as gravel. There are a number of grades of sand from very coarse to very fine. And mud, which is made up of grades of silt and clay. There are different sedimentary classification schemes and some are complex. However, simple sedimentary classification is typically a grading of grain size. A common classification used is the modified Falk classification proposed originally by R.J. Falk in 1954 and is commonly used by marine biologists. The classification defines particles into groups of mud, sand and gravel and places each type on the point of a triangle. The grading is based upon particle diameter with a boundary between mud and sand at 0 0.063 millimetres and the boundary between sand and gravel at 2 millimetres. The relative proportion of the grains are then categorised and used to describe the sediment. These categories can be divided into 5, 7 or 16 groups which is referred to as modified folk 5, 7 or 16. Looking at the modified folk 5, we can describe the seabed as boulder and rock, coarse sediment, mixed sediment, mud to muddy sand, and sand. By defining more categories, the seabed can be described more accurately, as we can see on the slide with the modified Falk 7 and 16. In layman's terms, sand and corsa are particles visible to the naked eye. Silt particles become dusty when dry and are easily brushed off hands and boots. Clay particles are greasy and stick when wet and hard when dry and have to be scraped or washed off hands and boots. Sediments are greatly affected by energy from tide and storms and typically divers will experience sedimentary layers below the intertidal range in the so-called sublittoral zone. It is noted however that sediments can exist in littoral zones such as mudflats frequented by wading birds. Modern seafloor mapping technologies have revealed linkages between seafloor geomorphology and benthic species in which groups of benthic communities are associated with specific geomorphic settings. This is important. In other words, as divers, if we wish to look for and observe a particular species, 
we will need to take into account the nature of the seabed which supports the community of organisms we are looking for. On the slide, we can see an example of a modified fork 12 solid lines mapped to a modified fork 5 dotted lines. This is typically used on the Merlin website, which is an excellent resource for marine life identification. So we can combine the geomorphic information with Bethnic species. For example, pink sea fans require herd substrates which they can attach, so it is unlikely we will find sea fans on a muddy based substrate. Typically, seahorses would be located on eel grasses, which grow on mud substrates below the intertidal zone. This is a slide of the sublittoral zone of the West Solent. The sedimentary mapping has used a modified Folk 12 classification to identify different marine habitats. We can easily see the effects of the tide on the land and can identify places of low and high energy. Low energy areas deposit mud and high energy areas are layered with gravels. To the west are areas of mud being deposited from the river Avonwater behind Hurst Castle Spit in a low energy area. We may find seahorses and oyster in this habitat. With the predominant high energy east flowing tide up the English Channel, we can see that mud and sand have been excavated from the central part of West Solent, leaving gravels. And at the top, where Solent water widens out, sand has formed in the medium energy area of Bramble Bank. This is a picture of a shoreline with a definition of different parts. We can categorise these shorelines into two basic types. Either rock, like we get off Chesil Cove, or sedimentary, like we have behind Hurst Castle Spit. The area of shoreline where land is subject to wave action is called a littoral zone. We have two types of littoral zone, hence littoral rock or littoral sediments, often abbreviated to LR or LS. The littoral zone is divided by depth. At the top we have the splash zone. We then have the high water mark where we get the super littoral zone. Below the high water mark we have the upper shore or the upper littoral zone, the middle shore or the mid littoral zone, and the lower shore or the lower littoral zone where we find the low water mark. Below the low water mark, we have the sub littoral zone, which is further divided. There are plenty of influencing factors in coastal habitats, and these include temperature variation, salinity variation, time exposed to air, competition, and amounts of sunlight. In the splash zone, we have very high salinity and it is commonly inhabited by plants which like salt, lichens and a small number of invertebrates which have become adapted to this harsh environment. The upper shore or upper littoral zone, as there is little water for organisms in this area of the shore, a marine life must adapt to survive drying out 
and extreme temperatures as the upper shore can get very hot. It is mostly inhabited by small periwinkles, barnacles, limpets and encrusting lichens. The middle shore or mid littoral zone is mostly inhabited by racks, barnacles, limpets, mussels, crabs, and enemies, and some types of both red and green algae. The lower shore or lower littoral zone is most commonly inhabited by red seaweeds and kelps, along with a wide variety of animals, um, and conditions are very stable. When we look into the categorization of littoral rock zones, there are three main littoral classifications which can be subdivided. The super littoral zone is at or above the mean high water springs that is regularly splashed. The mid or EU littoral, which is intertidal, is between the mean high water spring to the mean low water spring line. The sublittoral zone is further divided. This is permanently covered with seawater and where water is never so deep as to take it out of the photonic zone. This results in high primary production and makes the sublittoral zone the location of the majority of sea life. We can also start to develop knowledge in the understanding of marine biology shorthand, often seen on marine identification websites like Merlin. So, for example, LR, MLR, BF meaning littoral rock, moderate energy littoral rock, barnacles and fucoids or brown seaweed. In this slide and as previously described we have the splash zone at the top, the mid littoral zone or intertidal zones where we will find primarily green and brown algae. And we have the third main area, the sub-littoral zone. As divers, we tend not to enjoy being involved with seaweed and divers find themselves while shore diving in the sub-littoral zone. This is where those beach combers and rock poolers cannot get. This sub-littoral zone is divided into two, the infralittoral rock and circulittoral rock. The infralittoral is where we will get the algae that will photosynthesize. So we will get the brown on the upper infralittoral and the red on the lower infralittoral. The circulittoral is where we'll find almost exclusively the filter feeders like hydroids, sponges, anemones, corals, as they typically require less light to sustain life. All of the zones have a further level of classification, which indicates the energy of the water, typically from wave action. So we have high, moderate and low energy in the infra or circulittoral zones. And these are represented by the abbreviations of HIR, MIR, LIR, HCR, MCR and LCR. As an example, we have an insect described using a marine biologist's shorthand notation. This is IR, MIR, KR, LDIG, HIM, which basically means that it is 
an infraliteral rock of moderate infraliteral rock with K kelp, a uh, red algae, with luminary digitati, which is orweed, and Himanthia elongat, which is thongweed. Going back to our discussion on sediment, in the subliteral zone we also have sediment. However, unlike littoral rock zones, we do not categorise water energies. As if we had high energy, we would typically not have sediment. Marine identification sites like Merlin have used the modified Fort 5 method of classification as described earlier in order to describe a habitat. So they have used coarse sediments, mixed sediments, mud and sandy mud, and sand and muddy sand. Plus two other descriptors of SMP or sedimentary macrophyate or clumps of plants and SBR are sedimentary biogenic reefs or clumps of animals. I have placed two examples on this slide. So if we were to try and search for the long snouted seahorse for example we might want to look for a code of SS, SMP, SSGR, ZMAR which basically means subliteral sediments, macrophyate dominated, subliteral seagrass and its zoster marina. On the next example, if I was to try to hunt for a Ross worm, I may look for the code SS, SBR, POR, SSPI, MX, which basically means subliteral sediment, biogenic reefs, polychaete worm reefs, Sabrellia spinulosa uh, on a stable circulateral mixed sediment and in fact this is at Swanage. In the previous slide I've been looking at geological strata describing how sedimentary processes work, introducing some scientific terminology and codifying the marine habitats. These codes I've been using are in fact biotope codes. A biotope is an area of uniform environmental conditions providing a living place for a specific assemblage of plants and animals. Biotope is almost synonymous with the term habitat. The Joint Nature Conservative Committee, more commonly known as JNCC, is the public body that advises the UK government and devolved administrations on UK-wide and international nature conservation issues. They have produced guidance on the systematic description of biotopes, which is publicly available on their website. So on this slide here, we have an example of a biotope code, LS, LSA, MOSA, AM, SCO, EUR. And what we can see here is that that code is broken down into a number of levels. Levels 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. We can use the guidance from the JNCC and there is an excerpt to the right of this slide. And in that excerpt we can see that we have the code element description, so the abbreviation. We have got the meaning for the abbreviation. We have got the type that the abbreviation is referring to, whether it is a genius, a species, or a taxonomical grouping, or a habitat factor, for example. And it also indicates at which level those abbreviations can be used. So for example, levels four, five, or six. So when we look up back to the table, we can see that LS refers to a level two, which is the broad habitat of littoral sediment. 
LSA is the main habitat uh, of level three and is referred to as literal sand. MOSA is a level four biotope complex, which is saying that it's on mobile sand. Level five, we start to talk about uh, taxonomy and classification of the uh, creatures themselves uh, is the biotope. So this is indicating that it is an amphipod or a scolilepis uh, worm or effectively a, um, a bristle worm. And you've also then got the sub biotope, which is the uridice, uh, which is effectively a sea louse. So that's how we break down a biotope codes. With the seabed sampling and classification, we can start to build up maps of habitat around the UK. Here is a habitat map produced by the JNCC of the Eastern English Channel. These maps are produced for all parts of the UK coastline and can be a useful source of information for dive planning. Marine diversity hotspots have been identified from this mapping around the UK coastline and some of the top spots have been identified. From studies of habitats around the UK using biotope mappings and interviews with marine biologists, there have been some significant reports produced describing the location of marine diversity hotspots. These hotspots are areas of high species and habitat richness that include representative, rare and threatened features. The top marine diversity hotspots around the UK include Loch Maddy in Uist, South Uist, Rathallin Island, Strangford Loch, Menai Straits, Tremadog Bay, Helen Peninsula and Bardsey, Pembrokeshire Island, Milford Haven, Lundy, Falmouth to Helford, Plymouth Sound to Wembury, Salcombe to Start Point, Lime Bay, Chesil and the Fleet, Lulworth Cove to Kimmeridge Bay. And so to summarise, over the last hour, we've considered lots of geological processes over many millennia. We looked at the creation of the English Channel from the last ice age, the Fosdenegard plunge pools over the Wheel d'Artois anticline, touched briefly on the geological history of the UK, considered bathymetric surveys in erosion due to tide along the English Channel, considered vertical and horizontal sedimentary mappings along the Dorset coast, and even considered oil production in Kimmeridge Bay. We looked at the sedimentary cell theory. This is the erosion, transportation, deposition, and the lithification of sedimentary layers. We've considered sedimentary classification, looking at gravels, sand and mud. Considered the uh, littoral zones of the superlittoral, infralittoral and sublittoral uh, uh, areas of the coast. And we've also looked at the habitat mappings based upon biotope codes of the south coast and in fact of the wider UK. So I do hope you've enjoyed this presentation on marine geology, seabeds and habitats of the South Coast. And I'm Stephen Winstanley.